to 2 Kings chapter 25. 2 Kings 25, the last chapter as we close up on such a sad note, although we do have a little bright spot in it, we're seeing the final judgment of Judah. The fall and captivity of Judah is what my Bible calls it. And we're going to see the uh, uh, Babylon come down for the third time. You know, even with the northern tribes, when Israel went down a hundred years prior to this in Assyria, God sent them three times to carry people off. And, and they did it a little differently. They would carry off the, the weaker ones and leave the, the richer ones. But here Babylon carries off all the, uh, the royal people, carries off all the smart people, carried off all the, uh, uh, the grand people and left the poor uh, to deal with the land. And... But sadly, all that time, three chances to repent, to repent, to repent, and still no repentance. And we're going to see some of that in the final days, in the tribulation period, when God pours out his wrath, there'll be no repentance because hearts are already set. Hearts are already set in motion, even here. And even though God shows, the, well, I mean, you can take it all the way back 100 years prior, and God really had been sending prophets We could read it. We'll read it in a minute. Sending prophets to the northern tribes over and over and over, telling them to repent, telling them to turn, telling them to get right with him. And they wouldn't. They wouldn't believe the prophets. They wouldn't believe the word of God. And then finally, they're taken away in three different spurts to Assyria and, and uh, into captivity. And you would think the southern tribe of Judah would learn from watching that go on. But you cannot, you cannot learn from it. I mean, the only way you can learn is by going through it. And many times you think that a person would learn just by hearing the word. Faith comes by hearing, but you don't learn the hard lesson unless you go through the school of hard knocks. You have to go through it. You have to be corrected. You have to experience it, and then you really learn it. And we're always yelling for God, take me out of it, take me out of it, take me out of it. And we don't want to go through it, but you learn the best lesson going through it trusting God in it, and then coming out on the other side. Doesn't mean you won't ever go back to it again, because some of us are a little hard-headed, but it actually helps you to learn the lesson, to learn to trust God, to learn to believe God, when you have to literally go through it. Can he deliver us? Does he have the power? Yes, but he usually lets us go through it, so he can teach us, and it becomes ours, and we own it by experience. So we're actually seeing the last king. If you remember last week, uh, I think it was 2417, last lesson. Babylon come down their second time. Uh, and they had uh, made Mataniah, Mataniah, gift of Jehovah, uh, gift of Yah. Uh, he was uh, actually Jehoshan's uncle. I think he was Josiah's brother different mother he made his uh him king in place and then they changed his name to zedekiah zedekiah and zedekiah means uh, uh jehovah is righteous or right of jah and it's the last king of judah there's going to be zedekiah and of course again just like i said their hearts are already set but so what happens with zedekiah he doesn't stop rebelling He's rebelling against God, and he rebels against the authority in his life. He rebels against Babylon. Even though here's Babylon bringing strong judgment, Zedekiah won't listen to the prophet still, Jeremiah, and he doesn't listen to Babylon, and he ends up blind. And when we refuse to listen to authority, that's what happens is we end up blind. We, ended up with, we end up with delusion upon us, and we think we're doing the right thing, and we're completely lost when we won't listen to wise counsel. What's our uh, memory verse this week? Listen to counsel and receive instruction that you will be wise in your latter days. Uh, Proverbs 19, 20. It's, we're going to go through some of the Proverbs with counseling and just listening to counsel because God is the wonderful counselor. And we want to listen to his word and we want, we want to receive that instruction in our heart and then we can learn to become wise. And wisdom is not... Uh, Wisdom is not what the world would call it, but wisdom is knowing when to use knowledge rightly. So you can know everything and then use it wrongly and not have the wisdom of God. 
So we want to be spirit-led to know when to say what we need to say. We're not covering that verse this week. We will cover it next week and then move forward. So here we are. We come to the final chapter. It's a pretty long chapter, actually. Um, and there's several places you can read about this same thing. I was looking. Uh, in fact, when I was going to go, there's a couple places I want to go. I think we'll do it later. Now it came to pass, 25-1. Don't you like that? Can't stop. It's, it's in there. Don't you like it? Whatever you was fighting with last year, it's passed. It's gone. It always comes to pass. It's not here to stay. It's here to pass. You're going through the valley of the shadow of death. We're going through these states. And, and, and our struggles today can be our strengths for tomorrow if we'll listen to God. If we'll listen and obey, it can be our strengths for tomorrow. We can learn from what we're going through. It will come to pass if we will allow it. Uh, in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all of his army came against Jerusalem and camped against it, and they built a siege wall against it all around. Um, so the city was besieged until the 11th year of King Zedekiah. So again, you see this. It's, it's pretty amazing. Nebuchadnezzar means... Uh, um, made Nebo protect the crown or Nebo protect the boundary. Some say it's the prince of the god of Mercury or Nebo is the god of fire. There's some, there's some differences going on there. And then you have Babylon, which is uh, confusion by mixing. It's, it's, it, listen, it's also a name that was given to the kings of Persia. And we're going to see that in a minute. The kings of Persia. Well, what's Persia, Greg? Well, if you, if you, if you know with me that Iran used to be called Persia. They changed their name in the late 60s, I think it was, to, to Iran. And they kind of hide themselves now, and we don't know who they are, but they were actually Persia. And we see them rising up again, and we're going to see the reason for that uh, probably here in a moment. So they come down the third time uh, because the people are still being rebellious. When you have somebody that's your servant, you've conquered them, and they continue to be rebellious, and they're not listening to authority, they're not doing what they should do, uh, then, then you come down and you show more force. Now they're going to come down with the head uh, of the army. Everybody's coming down. And what do they do? They besiege the city until the 11th year of King Zedekiah. Did we say what Zedekiah means? Uh, Jehovah is righteous. Um, Notice this, a couple things, and we're going to see it again a third time. Three times. This is not This is not just like, oh, here is a story in the Bible. No, this is a testimony that's set in date and time. Three times you're going to get the date, the month, the time, when it came. And the same thing is going on today in the world. God tells us the date and the time and the judgment. Like, look at Acts 17. And this here is pretty clear. Three times he tells you the exact dates that God or that the Babylonians came down. So I just want you to see this in Acts 17 because it's actually already set where Paul is speaking to the uh, the, the Athenians at the Areopagus. It's a place of judgment. That's what we're talking about here. Judgment is already set. God has already set it. He's bringing judgment against Judah, finally, the third time here, where they'll uh, be carried away. And he says in 1729, Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, listen, therefore, since we, who, who are we the offspring of? Since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Listen. Do not make God up to be something that you devise, that you shape, that you create. He's fully revealed, not just in nature and in creation, but here in his word, he's fully revealed. Don't try to make some image or some idol or something. If I do this religiously, I'll be right with God. The only way to be right with God is through the blood of Jesus. When you repent and believe what he's done on the cross, that he paid for your sins. Verse 30, 
Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked. He's long-suffering. But now commands all men everywhere to what? Repent. This is a clear, clear, clear 31. Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained, he has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Listen, just like it's set down in date and time, Three times in this chapter, we're given the date, the month, who did it, the judgment come. God had warned. He had sent prophets. He's given us these types on purpose that someday judgment is going to come. You can't be scoffers and go, ah, it ain't nothing going to happen. We're okay. They've been saying that forever. Listen, God's long suffering only lasts so long. And we're going to have it soon <coughs> is all of the world is going to be judged. It's We're coming to the end of the age uh, and you can see that by the signs of the times. You know, they, Jesus said, you know, you, when the sky is red and threatening, you think that, oh, it's going to rain. But you cannot judge the sign of the times. You can see the sky and you think you can tell people when it's going to rain. We need to wake up, people. The Word of God clearly tells us what's going on uh, around us. So here they come. They're there. It's uh, the 11th year of King Zedekiah. We know these dates. And then it says that they besieged the city. Well, what did they do? They built a siege wall. And the siege wall has a tower. And a tower is, 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 what they did was they came and they built this, some type of a structure all the way around the city. Now, don't miss this. The city already has a wall, the walls of Jerusalem. And then the city's inside of it. So that what do they do? They come and they build this large wall that's got a tower on it where they can watch. Well, what are they watching? Nobody can come in. Nobody can go out. The food lines have been stopped they're controlling everything with ai i mean with their watch and their soldiers listen to me they're controlling everything today with ai they have built a tower they have built a wall around the world that you cannot get through it's a firewall and god is the god of or excuse me nebo is the, the god of fire it's a firewall that keeps you. They know where you're at. They know what you're doing. They're stopping all the food lines. Everything is being set up to besiege the city, your city, your heart, your life, to take over and govern you. Listen to me. This is serious stuff. We're at the end of the age. And this is what they did here to where they starved the city out. It was a common practice that you would do. Nobody can get in with any food. Nobody can get out. I mean, if you if you remember reading with us at one time they were eating their own babies they were eating their own afterbirth they God said that this would happen judgment would come verse three by the ninth day listen they were given this in the calendar it's been appointed we know it happened this is not some made up fairy tale this is the testimony of God judging the very nation that He created. That were following him disobediently. That he kept giving grace. And this is the very tribe he's judging the holy city and Judah. Where the, where the Messiah will come from. He's not judging them to destroy them though. He wants them to repent and be reconciled. And the same with us. He wants us to repent and be reconciled to him. It's a reconciliation of relationships. It's the gospel of reconciliation. It's not the gospel of death. That was the law. That was the old covenant. He wants us to be reconciled. Be reconciled to God. He wants us to come to him. The enemy will try to convince you that God is against you, but God loves you. You can trust him. You can, you can come to him and believe his word, and if you don't, you're going to be following some lie, and you're going to be lost. By the, ninth of the, by the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine had become so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. Listen, I put a note on my Bible. This is coming. This is coming. They didn't just attack all the seed, Monsanto. They didn't just attack all the gardens. They didn't just attack all, of, all the food lines on purpose. They are going to control people. If you, if you control the food, you will control the people. Money won't matter if there's no food to sell you. Verse 
Then the city wall was broken through, and all the men of war fled at night by the way of the gate between the two walls, which was by the king's garden. Oh, the king had a garden? Even though the Chaldeans were still encamped all around the city, and the king went by way of the plain. It's the, the plain of Arba, the Jordan Valley. But listen, notice how they use the Babylonians and the Chaldeans interchangeably. Remember, if you go back to chapter 11, Genesis, in the, in the Valley of Shinar, you find that the Chaldeans and the Babylonians, again, were used interchangeably. And, and the Chaldeans are, and we're going to see it on Sunday, because Caiaphas comes from the name Chaldean. And we're going to see Caiaphas, a false priest, who is not really the high priest in John chapter 11, is, is talking, he's prophesying, he's leading the people because Roman government has put him in as, a, as the leader. And the people follow him, and where do they follow him to? The Antichrist, Bar-Jesus, or excuse me, uh, Barabbas. And they cry out, crucify Jesus, the real son of the father. So here we have the Chaldeans again. They're coming down, they're sieging the city, they're keeping the people for eating. Again, the Chaldeans were the Magi. They were the magicians. They were the astrologers. They were supposed to be the most sophisticated people of the day. And they are ruling and controlling and dominating here. But who raised them up? God is the one that allows them to be raised up. Listen, God is the one that allows them to be raised up. Proverbs 21.1 uh, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Like the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. Listen, we have to understand that if God is bringing judgment against this nation, against our entire world, we don't want to be found fighting against God. And that's the testimony you're going to see in this text. That, that, that they could live if they wouldn't fight against God's judgment. And see, that's what we find ourselves doing is fighting against God's judgment. That's what the Tower of Babel was all about, was fighting against God's judgment. Let's build a tower that takes us above God's judgment. Let's create our own things that takes us above God's judgment, above God's word, above God's power, above God's authority. And it's the fool that said in his heart, no to God. Like you can actually become a God yourself. You can actually be wiser than God. There's no wisdom or counsel against God. And we need to be very careful with this. But these Chaldeans, see, they're encamped all around the city. And the men break through by the king's garden, and they go through both walls, the wall of Jerusalem, and then through the wall that was built by the Chaldeans or the Babylonians to siege the city. They, can't, they just bust right through, and then they, they're flying out of there. They're running, uh, and, the, and it says, And the king went out by the plain right there, uh, uh, Arba, the Jordan Valley, but the army of Chaldeans pursued the king, and they overtook him in the plains of Jericho. All his army was scattered from him. Well, isn't it interesting, the plains of Jericho? Isn't that where this all started at? This is where they crossed over, right in the same place at Jericho. The first city where they obeyed God, and they marched around it seven times, and they shouted, and they were given great victory. What was their first lesson with Ai? Their first lesson after that was they tried to take Ai without praying, without consulting God, without the counsel from God, without the wisdom of God. And there was sin in the camp because of those who were not following the authority of God. And what happened? People died. Wages of sin is death always. And when people don't obey, people die. And so now they're right back there. They, they had their first great victory. Now they're going to have their final Defeat right there in the same place, right back where they started because they didn't listen to God. And, they, and they've been in the land uh, for all these years. I forget what it was, uh, uh, 960 years or something. It was a bunch of years. And they haven't defeated the ites. They haven't done the things they were supposed to be doing. And they just thought that God was going to be a big softy and keep saying, I told you. But there's always a time of judgment with God where he's a just God. He's a loving, kind, benevolent God that you can trust, that you can trust that he's going to bring judgment. And it's not to destroy his children or his people or his nation. 
It's to, it's to get them to repent and to reconcile and understand that there's always going to be consequences and there's chastisement. So here they are uh, scattered in the plains of Jericho, right where they started at, their first victory. But they cannot escape God's judgment. See what they're doing? Just like, think about it. It's the next generations. And when, I mean, just in thought, when what happened to the first generation that refused at Kadesh Barnea, they went around in circles around that mountain for 38 more years. Now these people, they've kind of went around in circle in the nation and come right back to where they started at because they wouldn't obey God. You don't have to spin your wheels. You can go onward and upward. You can go forward. You can run a race to win. And you don't have to be back where you were at if we listen to the counsel of God. Six, six, number of man. So they took the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon at Riblah. And they pronounced judgment on him. That's what's going on at Riblah. Riblah is kind of like the headquarters right now uh, for the Babylonians. And what does it mean? Uh, fruitful. It means fertility. And guess where it's at? It's in Syria. It's a place in Syria. This is, this is where Babylon took over Assyria and all this area. But now we have it again in the news. That's where they're fighting from right now. Iran, Persia coming through, being led by China and Russia or backed by them, coming into Syria and attacking Israel from that border. That's what we have going on over there. And everybody's moving to that area with a hook in the jaw. Where are we at? Seven. Then they killed the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes. Zedekiah. Remember what it means? Jehovah is righteous. Judgment. It's righteous. They killed his sons right before his eyes. And then what, Greg? They blinded him. The very last thing that he sees is the death of his own sons, his own heirs, his own seed die. And it's the very last thing that he'll ever see in his life. That's some pretty evil stuff. To put your eyes out after that, you have to watch your own children die. Then they bound him with bronze fetters and took him to Babylon. Bronze, or yours might say brass, it's judgment. The Bible, bronze and brass is always judgment. Silver is redemption. Gold is always deity. Uh, you have blue, which is heavenly. You have red, which is uh, 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 the blood and it's mixed together with the blue and it makes royalty when you mix those together Jesus come from above he come from a heavenly place and he spilled his blood and it makes us royalty we become children of the king a lot of things that always uh, are types of so bronze fetters fetters are on the feet not the hands they, they restrain your movement he can't see now his movement is also Restrained, He can't walk. He's, he's shackled by the feet with either bronze or, or, or brass or even just metal chains uh, to keep him bound in prison. No more shackles on my feet. Yes. And took him to Babylon, took him to confusion. Let's look at it. See, because he could have avoided this. Let's look at Jeremiah 38. Jeremiah 38, and we'll start in, we got quite a few places to go. We could be here for a minute. I'll try to do it quickly. Jeremiah is right before Lamentations, which by the way, Lamentations uh, was written because of what's going on right now. Jeremiah was weeping about the judgment on um, Judah, the southern tribe, Jerusalem. And I'd like to read a lot more, but I won't. We'll just start in 38, 14. You have to know that right now, Jeremiah's in the dungeon. He's in prison. Why? Because he's telling them that they should obey, that they should listen, that if they want to live, they have to go down to Babylon. They have to come under the judgment of God and not be found fighting against God. If they fight against God, they're going to die by sword, by pestilence, by plague, if they fight against God. But if they want to live, they have to agree with God's judgment, and they can live. 
and, and there's a message in there for us. If we want to keep speaking the gospel, we have to listen. We don't want to disobey in the sense of unless it tells us to do something against God. You always have civil disobedience if they tell you to do something that keeps you from serving God according to his word. Now listen though, so he's in the dungeon, he's under arrest because he won't stop preaching the truth. He won't stop telling them that judgment's here. Judgment is here and that God has said. Listen, so he tells, here it is, in verse 14. Then Zedekiah the king sent and had Jeremiah the prophet, he's in the dungeon, brought to him at the third entrance of the house of the Lord. And the king said to Jeremiah, I will ask you something. Hide nothing from me. Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, If I declare it to you, will you not surely put me to death? And if I give you advice, you will not listen to me. Listen to me. This is the counsel that God has given us. So Zedekiah the king swore secretly to Jeremiah, saying, As the Lord lives, who made our very souls... Listen to what he was saying. I will not put you to death, nor will I give you into the hand of these men who seek your life. Then Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, thus says the Lord. Listen, the word of God always came from the prophet of God. This is how they got the word of God. It wasn't written down then. They believed the one who was foretelling the word of God, who had a relationship with God and was sharing the truth because he heard it from God. And he would come and proclaim it. This is the way they got it. We now read it in a Bible. We have the Holy Spirit in us, and he's actually hiding it, what's happening right now in the Scriptures. This is the foundation. And I do a very poor job of bringing it out, but we need to understand it. It's so much bigger than what we can even comprehend. 17. Then Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, Thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, if you surely surrender to the king of Babylon's princes, then your soul shall live. This city shall not be burned with fire, and you and your house shall live. But if you do not surrender to the king of Babylon's princes, then this city shall be given into the hand of the Chaldeans. They shall burn it with fire, and you shall not escape from their hands. And Zedekiah... Let me see how far I'm supposed to read. And Zedekiah, the king, said to Jeremiah, I am afraid of the Jews who have defected to the Chaldeans, lest they deliver me into their hand and they abuse me. But Jeremiah said, listen, this is the word of God that he's proclaiming. This is not just a guy speaking. He is proclaiming truth and perfection. They shall not deliver you. Please Obey the voice of the Lord, which I speak to you, so it shall be well with you, and your soul shall live. Listen, Zedekiah didn't have to be blinded. He didn't have to watch his kids die in front of him if he would have obeyed the word of the Lord. The church is in trouble today because we won't obey the word of the Lord. We're watching the next generation of our children die before us because we're ignoring the word of the Lord. And we're resisting instead of sharing truth. We think we can go out and win a nation by fighting instead of praying and sharing Jesus with them. And they're deceiving us into getting involved in a physical fisticuffs and battle like we're going to win something by taking over politics. That's not what we're here for. We're here to save souls. We're pleading just like, look, Jeremiah is, please, he's pleading, Obey the voice of the Lord so that your soul can be saved. But if you refuse to surrender, verse 21, this is the word that the Lord has shown me. Now behold, all the women who are left in the king of Judah's house shall be surrendered to the king of Babylon's princes. And those women shall say, your close friends have set upon you and prevailed against you. Your feet have sunk in the mire, and they have turned away again. Walk is turned away again, sunk in the miry clay. So they shall surrender all your wives and your children to the Chaldeans. You shall not escape from their hand, their power, but shall be taken by the, the hand, no power of your own, of the king of Babylon, 
and you shall cause this city to be burned with fire. Then Zedekiah said to Jeremiah, let no one know these words. Why would he hide the words? Let no one know these words because he's not going to obey them. See, if we're going to obey the word of God, we'll share it. We'll tell others so that they can have a choice whether they want to save their soul or not. Let no one know these words and you shall not die. Wait a minute, you heathen king. You already said I wouldn't die. You promised me. Now you're adding more conditions to it. 25, but if the princes hear that I have talked with you and they come to you and say to you, declare to us now what you have said to the king and also what the king said to you. Do not hide it from us and we will not put you to death. So they're going to come and threaten. And if they do, and then you shall say to them, I presented my request before the king that he would not make me return to Jonathan's house to die there. The gracious gift of God, the house of grace. Then all the princes came to Jeremiah and asked him, and he told them according to these words that the king had commanded. So they stopped speaking with him, for the conversation had not been heard. So nobody knew what conversation it was. Nobody got declared the truth that they needed to surrender. Now Jeremiah remained in the court of the prison until the day that Jerusalem was taken, and he was there when Jerusalem was taken. Listen, no harm to those who are proclaiming the truth. He was safe where he was at. See, he might have been in prison, but God was keeping him safe by putting him in prison. <clears throat> See, go through. You can rest in God's judgment. You can trust in what God is doing. Whatever is going on, he's still going to protect you and take care of you if you'll obey him in the judgment. Because judgment is coming. He took our judgment for us. Back in 25, where was we at? We're in... Uh, Let's see, we're on page 666. That's what it is in my Bible. 666, the number of man in judgment. Um, verse 8, new beginning, right? So listen, Zedekiah watched his kids die because he didn't listen to the word of God. Zedekiah, God is righteous, is what his name means. He knew it, but he didn't obey it. He knew it, but he didn't obey it. His name, very well name, meant God is righteous. He watched it, and then he was blinded himself because he ignored the word of God and led away in judgment and bronze fetters, brass fetters if you'd like. Verse 8, his new beginning. Again, we have the date. And in the fifth month, on the seventh day of the month, which was the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, a servant of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. This is the new beginning. What is it? You know what Nebuzaradan is? Nebo's seed is planted. Nebo has given seed. It's Mercury's leader lord. Now look at it, Nebuzaradan. That's where we get czars from. See that czar in there? We've been seeing them czars pop up in our government. We didn't have czars. Nebuzaradan. Now we have czars of everything, don't we? It's interesting stuff, but this is when they bring the guard. The judgment comes, and they got czars. He's the captain of the guard, the servant of Babylon. What is he going to do? He's going to do exactly what the word of God said. Since they would not surrender, they rebelled against Babylon. They rebelled against God's judgment. He's going to come and burn the city. Just like God said what happened. Because Nebo is the god of fire. I don't know. I thought, well, the devil's going to be in hellfire forever. Is that the God of fire? I don't know. Listen, he burned the house of the Lord. What do you mean? He burnt the temple. Listen, David planned it. Solomon built it. The God of fire burned it. Nebuzaradan, the czar, burned down the temple. The house of God. And then the house of the king. And then the houses of Jerusalem, that is, all the houses of the great, he burned with fire. Burned them down. Look over it. Um, hang on a minute. Burned them down with fire, verse 10, right? And all the army of the Chaldeans who were with the captain of the guard broke down the walls 
of Jerusalem all around. All around. Now this was uh, broke down, tore up until the days of Ezra. You can read about it in the book of Ezra. But let's look at 2 Chronicles 36. There's a lot of stuff here, guys, that you have to look over and read other things. And you can get other uh, testimony from the Word of God about what is going on. We're going to be looking at 2 Chronicles uh, 36. And I'm going to start in verse 11 and read to the end. Um, and you'll see a little hope in it. 11. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king. He reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. He did evil in the sight of the Lord his God. This is where I was telling you he didn't obey either government. God or Babylon. And did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet. Listen, you hear the word of God, you humble yourself, you obey it. But he did not humble himself before the prophet. He wanted to hear it so bad. I want to hear what Jeremiah has to say. Bring him out of the prison. Bring him here. Listen, I won't kill you if you tell me. And, I, and then he tells him the truth of what God says. And he would not humble himself and obey. And here it is. We're given, it, we're given an entire an account of it. Who spoke from the mouth of the Lord. And he also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar. So he rebelled against the word of God. And he rebelled against the judgment of God that was being brought by Babylon. Who had made him swear an oath by God. But he stiffened his neck and hardened his heart against turning to the Lord God of Israel. Moreover, all the leaders of the priests and of the people transgressed more and more according to all the abominations of the nations and defiled the house of the Lord. Why is it being burned down? It's already defiled. It's already destroyed. It's already not his house. It's already, you know, Jesus comes and he comes in. What does he do? He makes a whip and he says, you've, you've made my father's house a den of thieves. What's that? It's a grave. It's a burial place. It's the same thing we see in John 8. The same word for Lazarus is grave. It's supposed to be life and it had death in it. It was covered in death. So what does he do? He burns it up. He brings judgment. You reap what you sow. That's what you've been doing. You've been defiling it. You've been living like it was your house instead of my house. You made it an abomination and defiled the house of the Lord, which he had consecrated in Jerusalem. Remember the smoke? Remember all the, what was it, 30,000 animals that they sacrificed when Solomon dedicated the temple? Now, here's what I want you to see is a couple things here, 15 and following. And the Lord God of their fathers sent warnings to them by his messengers, rising up early and sending them because he had compassion, kindness, goodness on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God, despised his words and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people so there was no remedy. Listen, this is going on again in the church. It's going on again in the church. Everywhere you look, we let anybody preach the Bible. We let anybody talk about the Word of God. We let anybody, we'd rather let them tickle our ear and lie to us and have no power in, their, in the Word of God that they're talking about. And they bring in the whole world into it. And then we go, yeah, that's the gospel I like. Yeah, it's called bad news. It's no gospel at all. It's a lie. There's no good news in death. And therefore, the temple is destroyed. Therefore, the apostasy is complete. Therefore, judgment has come all over. Does not mean that there's not a remnant. But right here, he says, till there was no remedy. 17, therefore, he brought against, the, brought against them. Who did? God brought against them. God brought the judgment. The king of the Chaldeans. Who is that? The Babylonians. Where are they from? The Valley of Shinar. Who are they? They're the magicians. They're the astrologers. They're the pharmacy. They're the sorcery. They're the evil authority of the Antichrist. Listen, look how big the battle has been against us with pharmacia. Look at the battle. It was a sickness that they gave medication. That's sorcery. That's pharmacia. The whole battle against us to get us to be afraid and to listen and hide in our houses and destroy us was through pharmacia. 
That was the deception that come from the Babylonians, the Chaldeans, from the evil one. That doesn't mean that everybody that's involved in, in pharmacy is wrong, but it's what they're using, the fear of death. And the people of God should not be afraid of death. They should be able to rest. They should be able to rest. A false pandemic. Seventeen again. Therefore, he brought against them the Chaldeans who killed their young men. Really? Oh yeah. Killed them. Haven't you seen the feminization of manhood in America? Sorry, killed them with a sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion on the young man or the virgin, on the age or the weak. He gave them all into his hand. They're destroying children, gender. They're destroying everything. They can't do it without God's approval and God's judgment. Because we continue to harden our heart towards God's warning and ignore his messengers. We despise his words, scoff at his prophets, and he brings his wrath because there's no remedy. 18. And all the articles from the house of God, great and small, the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king and his leaders, all these he took to Babylon. Then they burned the house of God, broke down the walls of Jerusalem, burned all its palaces with fire, and destroyed all its precious possessions. And those who escaped from the sword he carried away to Babylon, where they became servants to him and his sons, until the rule of the kingdom of Persia, Iran. Listen, uh, notice that there was some people that were carried away. And they lived. Because they were not fighting against and resisting the judgment of God. Persia, I read, verse 21, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. As long as she lay desert, she kept Sabbaths to fulfill 70 years. See, they never did their Sabbaths. They were supposed to plant for six years. On the seventh year, they had a Sabbath. They weren't supposed to plant. They were supposed to, to, to harvest the crops and have enough put up to, to last the seventh year. And then, uh, and they wouldn't. And so God sent him away for 70 years. He wanted to get every single year of his Sabbath. And that's why he made the land lay desolate for 70 years. And they paid for it. Now here's the good news. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, Iran, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up, you can read about that in Jeremiah 25, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put in it writing in his writing saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth and the Lord God of heaven has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah, who is among you of all his people. May the Lord his God be with him him and let him go up there is a rescue there is a safety they started building it in Ezra's day it was finished in Nehemiah's day Nehemiah they had a heart to work and they had a trowel in one hand and a and a sword in the other and Nehemiah didn't tell anybody of the plans that God had put in his heart and it was rebuilt but it begins in Cyrus's day, why again, Proverbs 21, 1, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, and like the rivers of water, he moves it wherever he wishes. He raises up and he sets down. Power comes from God. Authority comes from God. It, it, he's in control of all strength and might. He's the head of all principalities and powers. Even when the evil king rules and brings judgment, God has control of him. And he's using it for judgment. And even when an evil king rises up as Cyrus in Persia, God uses him to go and declare the walls to be rebuilt and to begin the return 
to the holy city and the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the wall. It didn't get finished, though. Where are we at back here? Let's go back to uh, verse 11. So David wanted to build a house, but he had blood on his hands. So David set about when he was not allowed to build the, the temple, he set about to plan it out and to get all the supplies together. And his son Solomon brought peace. That's what Solomon means is peace. And he built the temple. And then now we have the enemy being used by God, burning it down because it was dead already anyway. It wasn't being used for what it was supposed to be used. Let's see, 2511. Then Nebuzaradan, Nebo has given seed. The captain of the guard carried away captive the rest of the people who remained in the city. And the defectors who had deserted to the king of Babylon with the rest of the multitude. Now listen, it sounds like a great deal of people and, and I don't, I, all I can tell you is that if you go to Jeremiah 52 and you read Jeremiah 52, it's almost an exact replica of this exact same chapter of 25. There's a few little things in there that are different and at the end of it, it actually tells you that the total amount of people was 4,600 that was taken away in this third move so there's poor people and there's farmers left behind to take care of the land. So I don't know how many people total have been taken away. But in this third move, only 4,600 people were taken. But it was all the sophisticated people. It was all the royalty. It was all the, and they burned down all their houses and then took them away and give them uh, a place in Babylon. Remember, that that's when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Daniel was taken, was in the first run of when they took them, if you guys remember that. We went there and looked at Daniel. Where are we at? So here he goes, uh, verse 12. Um, but the captain of the guard left some of the poor of the land as vine dressers and farmers. Um, so as it would read, you know, people that dress vines are vine dressers. They dress vines. Never mind. Um. <laughs> Stick to the scripture. <laughs> They tend vineyards. Farmers, actually, in the King James, is husbandmen. But it means to dig, to, they're plowmen, to uh, cut the ground. So they're still being productive in the land at the same time. Um, verse 13. The bronze pillars that were in the house of the Lord, notice we're going to go back to bronze, brass, the pillars. Remember the pillars? Uh, one was called Jason, one was called Boaz. Remember those pillars? You can go back in 1 Kings uh, 7.15. Jason means he establishes, and Boaz means uh, the left one. The right one was Jason, which means he establishes the left one was Boaz, which is in him is strength. Uh, and remember Boaz, the name Boaz, that's David's great grandpa. He was the first kinsman redeemer we see in the book of Ruth. So in the kinsman redeemer, there is strength. He establishes in Christ is where our salvation is at. These are the two pillars of the temple. It, I, that's just the way I see it anyway. So they're bronze pillars. And they were in the house of the Lord, and the carts, and the bronze sea. I was going to give you guys a picture of this. I didn't. I had a picture of it in my other Bible, like this one. I was going to copy it, and I said, ah, there's probably not ink in the printer, so I didn't. You can look it up. You can find a picture that gives you all of these uh, diagrams and shows you the, um, the bronze pillars that Solomon had made. The bronze sea, the carts of the sea. Remember the bronze sea? Or the brass sea it could be copper. It held, uh, um, it was a huge vessel that held 12,000 gallons of water that the priests would come and purify and clean themselves in before they would go in to serve. Uh, and and uh, then there was carts with movable wheels on them. They could move them around. Um, the carts of the bronze sea that were in the house of the Lord, the Chaldeans broke in pieces and carried their bronze to Babylon. They wanted those precious metals. They also took away the pots, the shovels, the trimmers, the spoons, and all the bronze utensils which were in the, the, the which the priests ministered. 
This is all the implements, all the things that were made of, um, weren't they originally made of gold and then they were taken before and, or something happened before and I think they changed them over, maybe, maybe not. Um, thinking out loud, probably shouldn't. Uh, 15, the fire pans and the basins, the things of solid gold and solid silver, the captain of the guard took away. So uh, uh, Nebo seed took this away. He planted seed and he takes all of these pieces away that were supposed to be used in the temple of God. The two pillars, one sea and the carts which Solomon had made for the house of the Lord. The bronze of all these articles was beyond measure. So there's a ton of it here, literally. Uh, the height of one pillar was 18 cubits. Of course, 18 cubits is about 18 inches. It was it was usually measured from the tip of your finger to your elbow. So it could be a little bit different according to how long your arm was or your forearm. And the capital on it was a bronze. The height of the capital was three cubits. And then, or excuse me, eight, one cubic is 18 inches, guys. Mm -hmm. So 18 times 18, whatever that is. Minus 27 feet. Does it say 27 feet? They're real tall. Yeah, 27 feet mm -hmm. sounds pretty. It says it in there, or is there a note? There's a note that says 27 feet. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. It made that a little bit muddy. Uh, the height of the pillar was 18 cubits, and the capital on it was bronze. The height of the capital was three cubits, which would have been uh, four and a half feet. And the network and the pomegranates, and all and the pomegranates are fruit. And all uh, around the capital were of bronze. The second pillar was the same uh, with a network. So they took all this brass. They wanted all of it. It's brass. It's bronze. It could be copper. Um, I don't know. Those words are used kind of interchangeably. They all stand for judgment. So in the judgment, they're taking everything out of the temple of God. Um, They plundered the place in judgment. I'm not going to read um, Jeremiah 52. You can do that for homework. But I have a note here that says read Jeremiah 52. Verse 18. And the captain of the guard took Syria. Let's just get my notes here. Syria means Jehovah is ruler uh, or Yah has prevailed. Soldier of Jehovah it can mean any of those three. And the captain of the guard took this soldier. He's the chief priest. Zephaniah, the second priest. Uh, Jehovah has treasures or secreted. Uh, and the three doorkeepers. He also took out of the city an officer who had charge of the men of war. Five men of the king's close associates who were found in the city the chief recruit, recruiting officer of the army. So see, he's, he's rendered them just totally defeated. Uh, who mustered the people of the land. So he got everybody going. And 60 men of the people of the land who were found in this city. So Nebuzaradan, captain of the guard, took these and brought them to the king of Babylon at Riblah. Fruitful. It's a place in Syria. Then the king of Babylon struck them and put them to death at Riblah in the land of Hamath. It's a walled or fortress place in Syria. Thus Judah was carried away captive from its own land. And again, like I told you, Jeremiah 52 says it was, 5230 says it was 4,600 people in all. But they're carried away captive. Some of them were executed. Those that were rebelling, those that deserted, and those that uh, were defectors, they were executed. And then the rest were carried away captive into Babylon. Where will you be carried away in the judgment? Are you going to be carried away in the rapture? Are you going to be waiting? Are you going to see the wrath of God? What did they do next? Well, they still have a land where they left poor people and farmers, so they still have to rule over it. They still are in power. They still have them as vassals. And it says in verse 22, Then he made Gedaliah, the son of Aachim, the son of Shaphan, governor over the people, 
who remained in the land of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had left. So they left the poor. They left uh, uh, some farmers. They wanted to go on and continue. Uh, and it says that Gedaliah means Jehovah is great. Yah has become great. Um, Achim means my brother has risen. <coughs> Japhon means, uh, oh, it's that one again, species of rock rabbit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got that one again, because that is crazy. As you it? said it, I knew what you were yeah. talking about. That's interesting, isn't it? So, so listen, Gedaliah, we're going to see Gedaliah was a man of God, and he's been made king. His name is uh, Jehovah is great, or has become great, and he listens to the word of God, and they kill him for it. Watch this. He became king. Now, verse 23, now when all the captains of the armies, they and their men heard that the king of Babylon had made Gedaliah governor... Uh, they, they say that he's, I think you can look it up somewhere. He's actually Jeremiah's friend, and they show them talking together. They came to Gedaliah at Mizpah. Remember Mizpah? Anybody remember it? Watchtower? Remember Mizpah, where the rock they set up with Laban and Jacob? Uh, when he left Laban, finally, with his two wives, Leah and Rachel, mm -hmm. and they had stolen the household gods, and and, uh, and they set up that rock and said, this is Mizpah. That's the place. That's a watchtower that God will watch between you and me. And so if you treat my family wrong, then God will get you. And it, and it was just kind of a, that's the name of the city there. So at Mizpah, and Ishmael, the son of Netaniah, I like to just look these up, guys. So Ishmael means uh, God will hear or whom God hears. If you remember when... Uh, Ishmael was in the womb. Abraham and Sarah try, or Abram and Sarah tried to fulfill the promises of God in the flesh. And she wasn't getting pregnant. So she said, take my handmaiden, Hagar, and have a child with her, and God will fulfill through this. Well, the baby in the womb, God told her when she fled the bad treatment from Sarah who was supposed to be representing God, she fled from this because she became uh, abhorrent to Sarah because she actually was fertile and had a child. And she fled into the wilderness, and when she was there by the well, he told her to go back and submit underneath her master, and the child, he, she, he would also make that child a great nation, but to call his name Ishmael, because God hears you, and he does hear you. He always hears. The question is, do we hear him? God always hears. He knows everything. Do we hear him? And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So Ishmael, uh, the son of Nethaniah, Johanan, the son of Cariah. Uh, Johanan means Jehovah has graced. It's a type of Jonathan or John. Jo Johanan, uh, God has graced or Jehovah has graced. I like that. Because we're going to see that Ishmael is actually from the royal family. They were supposed to be on the throne and they're not. Where are we at? I got carried away. Uh, the son of Karia, which means bald. Don't laugh at my bald head. <laughs> Saria. It's a different person than in verse 18, because remember, he's dead. So this is somebody else named Surya. <coughs> Can't be the same one, uh, which meant Jehovah is ruler. The son of Tanhumeth, the Nethophamite. Consolation is Tanhumeth, uh, and a dropping is a Nethophamite. Consolation dropping. Huh, that's interesting. And Jazaniah, which means Jehovah hears, heard of Yah. The son of the Makathonite, uh, which means pressure or oppression. 
they and their men, and Gedaliah took an oath before them. Now here he is before them as a man that's been made king, and their men, and said to them, Do not be afraid of the servants of the Chaldeans. Dwell in the land and serve the king of Babylon, and it shall be well with you. Now what's he doing? He's repeating the word of God. He's telling them what Jeremiah said. He's not saying anything strange. He's just giving them the word of God from the prophet of God because he's a friend of God and he knows that Jehovah is great. That's what Gedaliah means. And so all he does is take an oath before them and repeats the word of God to them. He doesn't make up anything new. And he tells them it will go well with you. No physical resistance, and you can still speak the word of God to people. If they tell you to do something that's ungodly, you don't have to obey. God always gives permission. But know this, anytime that you choose to follow God instead of what man says, there can still be pain and suffering and penalty from man. But God gives you rest and peace in that, that even if you die as a martyr, you still wake in the arms of God. Now it happened, verse 25, in the seventh month that Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, the son of Elishema, of the royal family, notice that, we're supposed to be in power here, came with ten men and struck and killed Gedaliah. Why? Because he was godly but not patriotic. It was okay with him for the nation to go as long as God was bringing the judgment. It was okay to preach the word of God and the truth of God and to say what Jeremiah had heard from God and not protect the nation. It's very important. We're going to see it in chapter 11 of John on Sunday that, that, that the enemy always wants to tell us to protect the nation, to protect the city. We're here for souls, and we always obey the word of God. And we always cooperate with the judgment of God. There's, there's no wisdom or counsel against him. How are you going to fight against the judgment of God? If God's doing it, why would you be found to fight against God? The question is, do we believe God's doing it? Everybody has to make their decision. Listen, he was godly. He was repeating the word of God and the message of God. To all the people still even after we've seen the other ones die so we know that the testimony is true Zedekiah all these leaders died the city's been burnt now Jeremiah already said that and it happened just like he said the word of God said and now Gedaliah is being killed because he won't be patriotic and protect the city but he tells them to cooperate with God's judgment. The Jews as well as the Chaldeans who were in with him in Mizpah. So they killed the Chaldeans that were there too, that were guarding or whatever they were doing. 26. And all the people, small and great, and the captains of the armies arose and went to Egypt, for they were afraid of the Chaldeans. So they killed the king, but they didn't even stay there and try to rule and reign and be an authority. They fled. They were afraid. As you will see, much of the people that are not trusting in God and they're trusting patriotism, they will walk in fear instead of resting in the counsel of God. But they'll show a point at everybody else. Same spirit today. Put the royal family and put America before God and what God has said instead of listening to the judgment of God. Now, it came to pass... Here's your hope. Here's your grace. Here's your mercy. Here's your future. Here's what you know. God is still on the throne. It came to pass in the 37th year of the captivity of Jehoiachin. Remember him? He was the king before his uncle was put in by Babylon, Zedekiah. He was the king. Jehoiachin, and it means Jehovah establishes. Jehovah will establish. And that's what we're being reminded of is that Judah is still on the march. Judah is still alive. The Messiah will still come from the line of the tribe of Judah. Will still come from these kings. 
He's been in prison for 37 years in captivity. He's the king of Judah still in the 12th month on the 27th day of the month, time and day in the calendar that evil Merodach, listen, his name is evil Merodach. Isn't that funny? That's his name. Isn't that funny? king's heart is in the hand of the Lord and like the rivers of water he moves it wherever he wishes what does evil Merodach king of Babylon and this is Nebuchadnezzar's son his name means um, man of Merodach uh, maybe he's Nebo's son uh, there is a Hebrew interpretation that says the fool worshiper of Merodach so it's the fool but God even uses the fool and the donkey in the year that he began to reign his first year released Jehoiachin king of Judah from prison he spoke kindly to him and gave him a more prominent seat lifted him up above everybody else than those of the kings who were with him in Babylon so Jehovah will establish Jehoiachin change from his prison garments See the salvation? See the grace? He took off his prison and captivity garments because Jehovah has established it. And he ate bread regularly before the king all the days of his life. And as for the, his provisions, there was a regular ration given to him by the king, a portion for each day all the days of his life. My daily bread, you prepare the table before me in the presence of my enemies. Listen. You can listen. You can obey God. You can trust His Word. And the grace of God shows that He moves forward and He's going to establish what He said He was going to do. You can always believe the Word of God. Even when He's bringing judgment, He's continuing to reconcile the world to Himself. He's not here to hurt you. There's a day He's appointed for judgment and we need to listen. We need to learn to hear His voice because we're going to reap what we sow. And in that day when he speaks with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God, we need to hear him. And if you practice today listening to his word, obeying his word, you'll hear him then. Because you'll have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. We need to have a heart for that. Get into the word of God. Get before God on your face surrender to what he's doing and don't be found fighting against and disobeying and not listening to the word of God he loves us he tells us what he's doing and it's coming quickly quickly don't be a scoffer be ready for it be watching waiting and working trust him and walk in his ways be led by his spirit as many as are led by the spirit of God these are the children of God there is much more there. I'm not going to continue to beat that. Uh, listen, this judgment was from God. And he said, cooperate with the judgment. And rest that I'm still on the throne. Even when it looks the worst, he's still on the throne and he protects his people. Nothing's going to happen to you. You're indestructible. You're untouchable. You cannot, God will not allow anything to happen to you that he hasn't already foreordained. You can trust him. It might hurt, but you can trust him that he's going to get you across the finish line and you can hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Just speak truth. Just like Gedaliah did. They might kill you, but you wake in the arms of Jesus. Father, thank you for your word. Help us to receive counsel and instruction that we might be wise in our latter days, Lord. The counsel of your word, by your spirit, for your glory for such a time as this. Thank you. We bless you, Lord. Wake us up at the heart of our Christian walk. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The Lord bless you.